uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so this work uh, uh, initiated when I was at Yahoo Research, uh, and um, it's been going on for the past four years. Uh, these are uh, uh, scientists and engineers who have collaborated with me. Along the way, we have published results with, and there are many others who have helped, with, helped me during the, uh, the research. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, supervised learning when you have many classes. So this is the abstract uh, view of uh, classification. I, I don't know what your backgrounds uh, are. Basically, I'm, uh, I'm going to keep the most of the talk at a high level, but uh, interrupt me with questions and, or after the talk. Okay? You can ask me about details and so on. So uh, in the typical supervised learning setting, uh, or just classification setting, so you've got an instance which could be a web page, an image, a user. Uh, you have cer certain attributes or features of that instance, and you give it to the classifier, and the classifier classifier says yes, no, this is the example for that class. Or if you, there are several classes, it will choose one or a few classes from that several classes. And the machine learning approach, uh, uh, you learn this classifier, this mapper, the mapping function. Uh, instead of, say, programming it, uh, like 20, 30 years ago, people sometimes uh, wrote rules to do this, so hardwired. So our case uh, is supervised learning, yes, but not binary classification or relatively few classes, but many classes. By many, I mean the, the, uh, the approach that I'm going to talk about, the index learning approach, becomes relevant when you talk about hundreds of classes, but uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, what, we, what I really have in mind is tens of thousands of classes. So I'll uh, uh, spend the uh, first uh, third of the talk on the, the setting and motivation, and then talk about the approach indexing or index learning, and then uh, just uh, report on some of our findings and conclude. So uh, the setting is, again, supervised learning, an instance uh, is a feature vector in, uh, um, in Rn, in the real space, Euclidean space, uh, where lowercase n uh, is the number of features. Um, and uh, each instance belongs to one or more true classes. The true classes during training is given to you. So for each instance, you know what, it belong what classes it belongs to. That's why it's called supervised learning. Um, when you are uh, deploying the classifier, you need to uh, classify unseen instances, instances for which you don't know which class it belong, uh, they belong to. So you, uh, I denote x uh, the training set, lowercase n, or the cardinality of capital F as the feature space. Each instance is described by a set of attributes or features. And y is the totality of the classes, the number of classes that you have. Uh, and again, this talk is about many thousands. So when I was working at Yahoo, uh, we had a number of uh, classification problems, uh, web page categorization, advertisement categorization, even query web uh, search queries, uh, small phrases or uh, streams of words as, uh, to categorize. Um, we wanted to categorize them to match, for example, uh, relevant ads to relevant uh, content, email or web page and so on. And we had many categories, not hundreds, but uh, tens of thousands, and in some cases, hundreds of thousands. For example, the Yahoo web, the web page categories, uh, the Yahoo directory has now over 100,000 classes, uh, similar for open directory project. And uh, we wanted uh, to classify in fairly uh, specific informative topics. So like, instead of just classifying in arts and humanities, you want to classify the, the, uh, the content into, say, Eastern philosophy. That's very informative. Or instead of just saying a sports, oh, this uh, document is a, is a, does belongs to a sports, you want to say, OK, it belongs to USC football. So that you have fairly precise semantics of, over the article so you can know what relevant ads to put on. So one uh, way to do this is supervised learning, uh, supervised classification. Um, and uh, text classification and text categorization uh, uh, has a number of uh, applications in personalizations, recommendation, advertisement placement that I just mentioned. Business analytics, we want to know what uh, portion of your queries are on certain topics uh, and, and uh, so on and so forth. Okay. So going back to text categorization to make things concrete, uh, so an instance 
is a vector that represents your, the document. Let's say you're doing document classification, uh, let's say news article. The feature extraction uh, phase, it just extracts the uh, unigrams uh, or the words, the bigrams, and so on, with the counts, possibly, of how many times they appeared in the, in the, in the document. And then during training, we have the class label. So we say, OK, it belongs to, say, baseball, which has ID 56. So an instance is a vector of uh, terms. The terms have certain IDs. So uh, the, for example, is always uh, feature ID uh, 10, say, I mean, feature ID 2 or whatever, and, 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 uh, and values. So many terms don't appear in the document. They will have implicitly uh, zero. Uh, uh, weight or zero value, and uh, the few that have uh, have their frequency, say, and so on. So this is feature extraction, uh, uh, and uh, as I said, uh, feature. I mean, instances belong uh, are in R n. Most of the va feature values might be zero. Tens to hundreds have a non-zero value, positive value, um, and you have. Uh, uh, um, uh, I'm not going to talk about feature uh, the feature extraction step. But there's, for example, for text categorization, it's understood that uh, often just the terms uh, are is sufficient to get very good accuracy versus doing parsing other types of features and so on. There is also normalization that you do various kinds of normalization, uh, TFIDF weighting. I, I won't talk about those, but uh, yeah, in our experience, we do uh, some of that too. Um, uh, there are other examples of uh, classification or prediction. Uh, this talk, classification, categorization, prediction, these are synonymous in this talk. So uh, this is at SRI uh, where uh, we wanted to uh, develop technologies that uh, uh, help uh, personalize the desktop experience. So one such uh, area would be uh, predicting what you're going to do next on your desktop. Let's say you are just looking at the email, and you want to save the attachment of the email, predicting where you're going to save that attachment, what folder. Or even uh, the, uh, foldering the email itself. Uh, if you're like me, you have now uh, tens of uh, folder names, and um, it just takes a while to find the right folder and so on. It would be nice using certain uh, features of the say, email that you're reading, for example, the sender a string or um, the content, uh, the terms in the content, and so on, and the subject, to predict, let's say, top three folders that the uh, system thinks that you might want to save the, uh, the email to. Uh, so in this uh, case, uh, we did experiments on Unix uh, prediction. This is the command, the full command that you're going to type at the Unix interface. The reason was we had lots of data on that uh, from uh, 1980s. On many, many users. So uh, we did the experiments there, and I'm going to report on some of the experiments at the end of the talk. Uh, and this, uh, this is an example of, uh, yes, supervised learning prediction, and it's online learning, because your needs might change over time. You work on different projects. Different projects got, get hot. Some new projects come along. Projects get old, and so on. So the system should, should continue to learn and adapt to your needs. So there's a, 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 an example of non-stationarity here. Um, that's good. Uh, this is uh, uh, Pas another Pascal challenge. Paul, Paul mentioned la last year's challenge on text classification. This is on the ImageNet that Princeton and Stanford folks have been uh, uh, creating. Uh, ImageNet is kind of like WordNet, if you know about WordNet, but it just has many, many uh, visual concepts. So they, uh, 10,000, actually, o over 10,000 now and over 10 million instances, about 1,000 training images using Amazon Tur uh, Turk for, uh, uh, for acquiring the example images per class. It's a hierarchy. And they took a 1,000 uh, many uh, 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 classes as a, as a, for the competition uh, to get the best accuracy in terms of classification. So here are some of the classes, the 1,000 classes. So French fries, mashed potatoes. For each of these, you'll see you, uh, there, there are example images. Black olive, uh, coneflower, and then blue daisy, and so on, honest, honey. Kentucky coffee, I think, coffee tree, and, and so on. OK? And this is just a portion of the 1,000 classes. So uh, uh, it's not, uh, you know, it's somewhat expected you, that you get many, many classes. I think we humans uh, uh, continually categorize our, wor our world, right? And because we are intelligent, we just don't have two classes or 10 classes, we are developing our concepts every day, and like our visual concepts. 
I think like the number of faces that you can recognize, probably hundreds. Uh, the number of visual objects that you can recognize, thousands. The words in the speech stream that you predict and classify as you hear things, uh, what's the vocabulary? Tens of thousands, right? And uh, you just not, don't recognize this, uh, the words, but the concept they refer to, many words are ambiguous. The verbs are very ambiguous. So, um, so this is a view of machine learning. Uh, 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 going from uh, f fairly uh, limited training data and fewer concepts to many. So uh, supervised learning, at one end of the spectrum, you have classes that are human defined. The human says, okay, system, I care about these two classes or 10 classes. Here's some training data uh, for each instance. I have assigned a class label to that instance as I just talked to you. This is the typical supervised learning, much studied classical, classical supervised learning and with lots of applications. And I, here I just give you some data sets that have, uh, uh, that have been used a lot for this. And so uh, as you go from the left side of the spectrum to the, to the right, uh, okay, so some tasks, uh, uh, the, the classes of interest might be human defined, but uh, the assignment to instances are implicit. Uh, somehow a natural activity can assign the class or classes. Uh, I mentioned several data sets. I'm sorry if you don't, are not familiar with them. Well, image tagging, I guess, uh, in Flickr. Uh, here the classes are assigned by humans, but many humans, and there's no controlled vocabulary, and they may not assign all the relevant uh, visual tags to the images, so uh, it's much less controlled. It's not like classic supervised learning. There's a lot of noise. Uh, predicting the next word, let's say in uh, natural language, in English, given the previous word. This is called a statistical language modeling and it helps for speech and so on. Here, again, when people are uttering, they're not thinking about, oh, I'm gonna train a system. They're just writing their English or just speaking, right? Uh, so you get a lot of um, training data. It's noisy, and, um, but um, uh, still uh, very useful for uh, training. Uh, uh, systems. So the uh, end of the expression is where the, cla the machine, if you can get systems where the machine defines its own classes of interests and uh, somehow using the environment uh, uh, finds out what classes that it has defined correlate with what it sees with the features. So in this case, uh, uh, I, I don't talk about these, but uh, uh, this is kind of autonomous learning. Uh, 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 I, I, I have a, a a kind of an abstraction of this I call prediction games where the system makes new classes and uses the context uh, to uh, predict those classes. Um, but as, uh, as we go from um, uh, uh, left to right, we, we get more machine autonomy, more noise and uncertainty in terms of the uh, features, values, and the class assignments to instances, but we get more training data and often more classes, and things get more interesting. So this is just an overall view. Let's go back to the talk. Uh, the, in the abstract, uh, this is supervised learning where you have many, many classes. Instead of binary, you have uh, hundreds or thousands. So many instances, uh, high dimensionality to, to each instance lives in a very large, uh, the, the, uh, for example, in text categorization, the terms are your features. What's the vocabulary size? Could be tens of thousands, right? Of phrases and so on. Um, and uh, what's new to this talk, uh, relatively new is that we are uh, talking about a huge dimensionality for the output of space too, for the number of classes too. Uh, in general, yeah, you have many instances, much more than, hopefully much more than number of features. Uh, uh, and uh, the number of features, hundreds of thousands, is uh, often greater than the number of classes, uh, cardinality of y. Um, and uh, all of them are much, much greater than zero. Uh, and I mentioned other things about this, uh, that um, uh, basically you might have uh, feature noise, feature value noise, class noise. Um, classification may not be an end to itself. Uh, sometimes classification is just an intermediate step to further do categorization or do other inferences. Think of a robot. So it, once it decides that the, the, the thing it's saying, seeing is a pedestrian or a policeman or something, it has to take in, uh, uh, um, uh, appropriate action. So classification has to be very quick. Uh, we don't want costly systems. That's really what motivated uh, my work. Uh, <laughs> striking a good balance between efficiency and accuracy. Um, several existing techniques for classification. 
especially when you have many classes. <laughs> um, one versus rest uh, is, a, is a fairly simple conceptually uh, method that's been used. Here you train binary classifiers. So binary is uh, those type of classifiers whose output are yes or no. Uh, usually linear, or but you, it doesn't have to be. And then you treat the problem as uh, as a flat, basically. Each class is its own entity, and you have a binary class for sports, say, for politics, and so on. And uh, given um, and a new instance, you try you uh, apply all the binary classifiers to that instance, and uh, whichever says yes, it belongs to me. The instance belongs to that class. Usually these classifiers have a scores. They don't just say yes or no. They can also give you a numeric score, and you can take the highest score. So, but if you have 10,000 classifiers, and if the instances are coming rapidly, let's again think about a real-time robot, you don't want to be applying 10,000 classifiers to each instance. Okay? So uh, it, uh, I think the major drawback of uh, this uh, approach, uh, one versus rest uh, training and classification, is uh, uh, classification time inefficiency. Uh, there is a more subtle problem that I uh, mentioned in the experiments where you get actually less accuracy because these classifiers are trained independently. The advantages are this is uh, uh, during training, you can completely parallelize this. All the binary classifiers can be trained independently. Again, yet a disadvantage is that uh, this, the number of binary classifiers times the memory requirements could be huge. So another possibility is top-down classification. Uh, this is where you have a taxonomy coming up with your data. It's not just training data each instance, you know what the labels are, but actually the classes, the labels, belong to a, a hierarchy, a taxonomy. So in text categorization, for example, we have generic classes at the top, for example, sports, humanities, uh, commerce, and so on, and uh, refined, more precise classes at the bottom. And the way uh, you do this, well, I have it in the next slide too, I think, yeah. So, uh, basically, you train binary classifiers or multi-class classifiers for the top, uh, the most generic classes. You don't have many of them. You have tens of them, maybe. And uh, they uh, um, serve as filters. So uh, when, when an instance comes for classification, you first apply the top classifiers. If they say yes, then you go down. You go to the children of that class and um, ask whether it belongs to any of the children, and so on, and you go down further. Uh, there are many pros and cons to this. One is that what if you don't have a taxonomy? You have to program the taxonomic structure into your classification system. I was, I, I was using this for efficiency reasons initially before going to uh, 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 the, the indexing approach that I'll talk about. Uh, but yeah, so um, uh, uh, the issue of uh, having to encode the taxonomy, and sometimes the taxonomy is not simply a tree. It's a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. Uh, uh, and uh, classification accuracy can get hurt if you do it plain top down because if there are mistakes at the top, if some classifier says it doesn't belong to me, then your host, if it just made that mistake at the top uh, uh, and while it really belonged to the one of the children, uh, you, uh, uh, you, uh, you uh, incur penalty and yeah, you see that accuracy of the top down technique in our experiments is lower than um, uh, uh, simple multi-class flat index learning. There is another approach, uh, neat approach, it's called Kenyer's Neighbors. So in this case, your instances become uh, points and uh, your training instances become points in Rn and you have a similarity metric, let's say Euclidean distance or cosine uh, similarity. And when a test instance comes, you just look at your nearest uh, uh, instances in your training data to that thing like the top 10 or top 100, 500, whatever, it depends on the, uh, on the task. Uh, and uh, you take their vote. The top 10 or top 500 instances, they vote, and the, most, the class that gets the highest vote is the class of your test instance. Uh, this is uh, great. You, you have no training time. Uh, but the problem is, again, think of the robot. It has to keep all the 1 million instances, and on each, instance, on each test instance, it has to find all the nearest neighbors which is, could, be, uh, uh, could be a lot of inefficiency. And also you have to uh, have um, uh, the ad uh, appropriate uh, distance metric. This is not satisfactory either. Uh, but all this really depends, especially in nearest neighbor, it really depends on the application uh, and so on. Is, is, is it real time and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, okay, so I mentioned about top down. 
uh, the classification. If the parent classifier says yes, then you go down deeper. And I also mentioned that you usually care about uh, uh, classes at depth four and below. The, the more precise and accurate the classification, the better. You don't care in some tasks, at least in the general top level, the top level classes. And uh, because if you do top down, if the top classifiers make a mistake, then you have incurred a loss. If they say no and you don't uh, 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 examine the children, um, yeah, basically you have incurred a, an error. Um, okay, so again, in the, ch in the case of uh, many, many classes, let's say X is your instance uh, and these circles are your classes, how do you quickly say what which one of these circles should light up? These are the concepts or classes. You don't want to apply uh, 1,000 or 10,000 binary classifiers to your instance. That would be just too inefficient. Um, uh, you might not have taxonomies, or they might be de evol evolving, and so on. Uh, I was reading when I was uh, doing research, re research. I was reading about concepts in humans, and there was just this um, issue whether the humans humans in classification use um, taxonomy. So, for example, a dog is a mammal, is an uh, is an animal, is a living entity, or not. Uh, it's not clear, so, uh, well clear, but it is the case that uh, there are certain concepts that humans are very fast at. It, this is culture uh, dependent on culture too, but uh, humans are very fast at classifying certain concepts. For example, if, the, uh, if you ask a person given a picture of a dog, uh, uh, here probably they would quickly say, yes, it's a dog. But if you ask whether it's a mammal or an animal, it takes them a little longer. So, uh, and this has been uh, documented and, and so on. And certain concepts like the concept of a dog or a cat are, they call, they call it base level concepts. They have certain advantage in terms of real time, like for example, response of humans. So kind of this was suggesting to me people don't do top down, they don't say, oh, is this an animal or not? Somehow they directly look at the features of the image and say, okay, yeah, this is a human or this is a, a, a dog and so on. So, uh, so I was going, uh, I had implemented uh, uh, top-down classification, uh, but I was thinking maybe there, there should be an easier way of doing things. Okay, so I talked a lot about motivations and the setting, and talked a little about other techniques. Um, let's talk about <coughs> uh, uh, the approach. So the idea is, uh, uh, what if the features directly, the features of the instance uh, uh, directly told you what the class was, or at least narrowed down the possibilities from the tens of thousands quickly to maybe tens quickly. So this is an index, basically, a mapping from terms or features in general to uh, uh, a choice of few classes per term. It's a mapping, a, a bipartite graph, a, a graph uh, uh, or a search engine. Uh, I, 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 and I sometimes call it a recall system. It recalls the right classes given an instance. So it, like, just like an inverted index, a search engine. But we want to learn this, this index. In search engine, you know, when you uh, in, uh, build uh, the, uh, the index, you basically connect every term of a document to the, uh, to the uh, document ID. But here we want to we be very uh, um, selective in what, uh, which features to connect to which classes. So we want to learn the index entries. So we want to learn the index. Um, and the goal is to learn, uh, to uh, strike a good balance between accuracy and efficiency. I was willing to uh, uh, lose on accuracy if it was, I was going to get uh, much gains in efficiency and especially simplicity. Okay, so um, the hope is that yes, the features are good enough, that uh, there are good f predictive features that need not connect to tens of thousands of classes. They just they are very. Uh, precise, or at least they can narrow the possibilities to tens. And if you, you take the votes of the features, if you aggregate their votes, uh, then you can hone down to the, the right class uh, uh, accurately and efficiently. And that you can find these features and the right weights, I'll talk about what the weights mean, uh, efficiently. So you can learn this index, uh, this mapping efficiently from features to classes. Okay, so in a nutshell, uh, here's the uh, the task, your input, your, uh, this is supervised learning, your input, you can think of it as a tripartite graph. You got the instances in the middle. Each instance uh, has certain attributes, certain a features active, right? Not all of them, but some of them. The others all have zero value. And on the other side, 
uh, your training data, you, have, you know uh, an instance belongs to one or more classes. I'll be talking mostly about one class per instance. OK? And this is the input. Uh, it could be a finite input. It could be a streaming. It could come one, uh, a little at a time, like in the, our desktop application. And you want the output uh, is, or what you want to maintain is a bipartite graph, the index, from features to classes. Um, a mapping, uh, a sparse mapping, where each feature is connected to zero or more classes. Doesn't have to connect to any class. Maybe the feature is useless. It's not predictive at all. Um, uh, but the, in general, we want the uh, connections to be few. And this the underlying assumption is that your task has fairly good predictive features. So the, feature, the connection from feature i to class j is uh, called w sub ij. Uh, another way to think of this is just you're learning a matrix. Uh, let's say the rows, the rows are the features, and the uh, classes are, uh, the columns are classes. Uh, it's a huge uh, uh, matrix, but it's very sparse. So while the number of columns could be tens of thousands, the, the number of rows, the features could be millions, uh, in each row, we want to have very relatively few non-zero uh, weights. Uh, so uh, uh, what we are doing is a linear classifier learning. Because this is a matrix, it's just a linear classifier. The index is a linear classifier. Um, uh, the, the algorithms that we, I'll talk about, they, they make the assumption that the in instance, uh, the feature values are non-negative. Uh, uh, there are ways to make negative features uh, uh, non-negative. There is pre-processing steps that we can do that, so that's not a big assumption. Uh, the other uh, uh, property that these algorithms have, uh, so far at least the indexing algorithms, are that they, they learn a non-negative weights too. The matrix entries that they learn, the weights will be zero or positive. So uh, uh, simply the indexing approach is you learn a, a sparse weighted by part of the graph, where each feature connects to relatively few uh, classes. Uh, so let's talk about classification. That's simple. It's just a, uh, or prediction. This is just a matrix dot product. So let's say your, feature, your instance had only two features, features two and three. Uh, let's say it was Boolean, so the value, feature values were one. The rest of the features are zero. So what happens, looking, you look up the index, page, basically. Uh, features are activated. There are relatively few connections. I, I haven't talked about what we're going to do to learn these connections, but Let's say you had, they had a few connections to the classes. Those guys are activated. Uh, they are scored and ranked. Okay. So let's say if there were there were weights on these edges, then uh, class uh, C4 gets the highest rank. It has a score of 0.3 plus 0.2. So it gets 0.5. It gets ranked highest, and then class C3, C5, and so on. So what is the what does the system say? The class for uh, instance X is. It says it's class four. Simple as that. OK? Uh, so yeah, that's just equivalent to a dot product between the matrix that corresponds to this index and the instance. Uh, yeah, so like it's just uh, uh, like use of inverted index indices for uh, document retrieval. Here we retrieve concepts instead of documents. And it's a sparse dot product, too. Uh, OK, so uh, let's talk about uh, complexity, the time complexity of this. Um, uh, so yeah, if the, the out degree of each feature is d, uh, and x, uh, the cardinality of x corresponds to the number of uh, uh, non-zero features or active features of the instance, then it does, it's a function of just d times x. So on average, if the, each feature connects to d, and instance x has d features, it's simple as that. There could be some sorting and so on, so I put a tilde on the big O notation. Um, I haven't talked about training. I'll talk about it in a few slides. But training is basically this, this, fun, this function, too. So uh, yeah, again, if you budget, if you don't allow features to connect to, uh, uh, to, connect to too many classes, it's very efficient. Prediction and classification, you can see it. It's just d times x. Okay, So d, uh, the out degree could be in the, uh, on the order of tens or hundreds. Uh, and it has competitive accuracy, as we'll see. So uh, let's talk a little about learning. Uh, so now uh, 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 you have the training data. Our focus has been on online learning. So I'm going to talk about online learning algorithms. Uh, you get, begin with an empty matrix, empty index. Uh, the features are not connected to any class. 
um, given an instance, you apply your index, you try to classify the in instance, and if it made a mistake, you update uh, uh, the, in the index. This is classic online learning. Uh, for getting better accuracy and so on, there are some twists to this, but that's basically it. If you made a mistake, if your system made a mistake, update it. Update the index, update the connections. Uh, the details are how you update and so on. Okay? So initially, when the, class, uh, when the in index is empty, there's no weights, there's no edges, and so on, it's going to be silent. It's, gonna, it's not going to report any class, and that's a mistake. So you, uh, you update the uh, index. So uh, the, the initially, uh, the, the experiment, the mind experiment that I, I, I did is this. Let's say uh, 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 an, a feature is active in, in, a, in so many instances that it's seen with many classes. Uh, how do you uh, connect? Which, which one of these classes in the stream do you connect um, the feature to? Let me see. Yeah, yeah. So let's say the feature, as time goes on, it's, it's seen with, with class 24 first, and then class 5, and then in another instance with class C2, and so on. The question is, which of these should the feature connect to, right? Some of the classes could be noise, could never be seen, or may get, they may get old after a while. Uh, and again, the, uh, the constraint is we don't want to you don't want it to predict uh, many classes. Um, so uh, the answer is, if, if it was a, a one single feature alone, you would connect it to the classes with the highest proportion in the stream. So you, the feature keeps a statistics on each uh, class, uh, uh, the proportions that it sees those classes, uh, and uh, just keeps uh, and then connects to those that have highest ratio proportion. Uh, but the issue is that, well, again, you don't want to keep the statistics for all the classes, but that's simple. We just uh, keep the top 10 or top D, whatever the budget is. Uh, uh, and uh, you can show that uh, for, the, uh, for a single feature case, if you had only one feature to worry about, uh, this is equivalent to I iceberg or hot list item. So you have a web, uh, 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 you have phrases searched on the web, and you want to know what is the hot? What is hot today? Uh, what is the most frequent uh, thing that's being queried? Uh, this is a similar thing, or data streaming algorithm. So this is, but we are talking about only a single feature. So um, uh, if the feature had a budget of 10, the best thing to do would be to connect it to the top 10 highest proportion features. You keep, if you, let's say your budget is 10, you keep about 20 or 30, that's one way to do it. A, a total budget of 20, 30, uh, and you always keep the s classes sorted. If a class is not, uh, it has the lowest uh, proportion, you drop it, and you, you have to insert another class, you drop it. This incurs some approximation, but you can show that you are, for the purpose of computing the top 10 classes, this, is, uh, this comes close to the optimal. Okay, but that was uh, for, uh, uh, for a single feature. So um, that's the basic idea. So features will keep weights, non-negative weights, which kind of corresponds to proportions, the proportion of the classes that they see the, on their own, in their own streams, with a few twists. But yeah, that's basically the, uh, the uh, and then you and drop, you either have a, a budget of like, let's say 20, 30, or whatever, some number, and you drop uh, uh, proportions be, uh, beyond that, or you have a, a weight threshold and you drop uh, uh, classes uh, beyond a certain weight threshold, if they are lower than that. Um, and uh, so why should this work? Uh, why uh, should we expect to get competitive accuracies uh, with indexing compared to other techniques? Uh, while we have many classes, I have talked about tens of thousands of classes, we have many features to, in many applications, text categorization and so on, we have maybe an order of magnitude more features. So it's not, uh, 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 it's not a very strong assumption that there can be low interaction between features. So that is, that is uh, uh, among the classes. Uh, the features that are predicted for one class are not going to be predicted for all the classes. I mean, that's a, a kind of a, a impossible. So uh, yes, there will be interaction but uh, uh, between classes. Cla some classes are similar to each other, but it's not going to be uh, huge. 
Um, so uh, assuming that features need only connect to 10, 20, 100 classes is not a high assumption. Um, as I said, in, one, in the best of obviously optimistic world, each feature needs to connect to at most one class. This is the zero interaction. Uh, uh, while uh, in reality, that's not the case. In reality, it's not also the case that you have very high interaction. If you have very hard to discern classes, basically all classific classification techniques fail. Um, uh, I, might, I must say for uh, this vision for image classification, it's a big research area, how to get uh, predictive features. For text categorization, you get accuracies of 80, 90% and so on. Uh, but um, for image classification, like those images that, I mean, those classes that you saw, French fries and so on, we, uh, it's a big research area. How do you get from the signals from the pixels to uh, appropriately predictive semantic features? Uh, but yeah, here our assumption has been that the features are pretty predictive. There exist pretty, pretty uh, very predictive features, and so uh, I just talked about kind of a one algorithm. You keep each feature keeps proportions. Uh, I didn't talk about the twists there, but the other algorith algorithms, exponential moving average uh, uh, and uh, uh, ooze, that uh, is an acronym for uh, uh, hinge loss minimization, are variants of uh, of that. And I'll talk about uh, Emma a little exponential moving average. So uh, the exponential moving average is just the, uh, the online or the non-stationary version of the proportion computing technique that I just talked about. So uh, basically, let's say O is your observation, the observation, a stream of observations. It could be numeric values, or in the case of classes, it could be discrete. Either you see the class or not, one or zero. And the weight at time t minus one gets multiplied by a, a, a one minus beta, some mixing factor, and then beta plus the observation at time t. That's, that's the, basically a convex combination of the previous observe, weight plus current observation. Uh, 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 it converges to the average of the sequence OT if you do this moving average. Uh, and um, uh, as I said, it's uh, appropriate for the non-stationarity. The mixing rate beta, uh, is between 0 and 1, and it's an effectively uh, it's a window size uh, control. How much the past matters. Uh, if beta was 1, for example, you see that uh, the past doesn't matter at all. Uh, beta, if it's 1, the, uh, it's going to be multiplied by 0. And then uh, only the current version matters. But yeah, so, uh, so here's the simulation for exponential moving average. Uh, you multiply 1 minus beta time all its edges, let's say feature two has uh, four edges, you weaken, by multiplying by one minus beta the weights, you are weakening, thinning, I'm showing that by thinning uh, those uh, edge connections, decay weights, and then you increase the weight to the true concept. Let's say x belong to class C3, uh, so uh, you add a beta to that, uh, to that connection, so it becomes thicker, I'm showing it, and that's it. And also, again, you drop tiny bits. You have a weight threshold. If the weight goes below, say, 1%, you drop it. Um, so uh, that's the weakening part, 1 minus beta times the current connections of feature f, and beta times the, uh, the vector of true classes of instance x. Um, OK, uh, I mentioned a few twists. Uh, for better accuracy. Um, so one thing you do is you don't update all the time. You don't update your index all the time. So if your system gets the instance correct, uh, you just, uh, you don't, uh, you usually, uh, uh, I mean, in, in pure mistake-driven update, you don't update. Uh, more generally, though, uh, you compute the score between uh, the true class and the highest scoring negative class. If the, the difference was not large enough, if the margin, we call it margin, if the difference or the margin was not large enough, if delta x, the margin on instance x, was below a threshold, then you update your index. So basically, yeah, each feature that was active that had non-zero value in your instance weakens its connections, and then um, strengthens its connection to the right class. Um, and again, for memory efficiency, you can drop tiny weights. Um, OK. Uh, I, I, an exponential moving average is uh, uh, converges to the uh, 
if there is a static average converges to that, but you can show other things. For example, it's also derivative. It has a, a gradient connotations and so on. But let's talk about uh, the other, uh, up, uh, other uh, update ooze, which uh, basically each feature has a budget, uh, has a weight source, uh, let's say a dummy connection to ca class zero, and always borrows from that connection. If it has, a, like initially each feature has a budget of 1.0. At most it can have a weight of 1.0 connection to its other connections. Initially it doesn't have any connection to other classes, it has a, just a budget to a, or a connection to a dummy class. And on each update, it takes from that budget, if there is anything left, and uh, distributes it to the true classes. If it doesn't have anything connected, or if the budget is not enough, it might borrow from the false classes. So that's the basic idea about ooze, or um, oozing the right amount of weight to the true connection. So in this case, uh, class three belongs to, I mean, x belongs to class three. So at first it checks with the budget. Let's say there was some connection, some weight remaining in the, in the budget. It shifts some weight to that. And if need be, it can shift weights from uh, other classes to, uh, in this case, from class C2 to class C3 to the true class two. Um, I'm not going to go into details of uh, ooze, but it's uh, minimizing hinge loss and so on. Ooze is more, uh, has more uh, data structures, more bookkeeping than uh, Emma and does better on text classification. On certain ca cases, some data sets, they are competitive, some tasks, but uh, in, uh, for text classification especially, it's more, um, it has more accuracy, it gives you more accuracy. Uh, so indexing, as I said, it's a linear classification uh, paradigm. Uh, we are learning a matrix very closely related to multi-class perceptron and passive aggressive algorithms. Uh, the difference is that if you look at the matrix that we are trying to learn, where the columns are the classes uh, and the, uh, uh, the rows are the features, uh, you best, it's best to view those algorithms, multi-class perceptron and family, as adding or subtracting your instance uh, with the, to the true class. So it's a column-wise operation. And there is, uh, there is uh, no check for uh, memory efficiency and so on. Uh, we are focusing on the rows. We sometimes take weight away from all the non-zero weights of a connection and then add it to the right class, uh, or, or as Ooze does it uh, in some other ways, or only take it from the budget or some uh, false, uh, false class. So uh, it's the difference is uh, focus on the rows or columns. Why did we focus on the rows feature focus algorithms like what I talked about, Emma, and so on? Uh, it's uh, because we wanted to control the out degree of each feature. We didn't want too many non-zeros in each feature's connections for efficient uh, training and classification and memory efficiency and so on. Yes, yeah. It depends, I mean, it depends on the task. Like bioinformatics tasks, sometimes you have many row, uh, features uh, uh, well, at least the number of rows or features is sometimes higher than the number of instances. They get only a few spe specimens. Or, uh, but in text classification and um, speech, vision, uh, yeah, we get many, many instances. And we, you can define many features. Yeah, the number of rows is usually huge. And the number of classes then I'm talking about now in some applications here, large-scale learning, you have thousands of classes too. But if, usually you can assume the features, the rows, is much larger than the number of columns to the more classes. Uh, um, yeah, so the previous approaches like the multi-class perceptron, they just don't do any weight dropping. Uh, they just keep all the weights. There is no, uh, so yeah, you can run out of memory if you have 20, uh, 100,000 classes. Um, and, and also the updates can get, become slower and slower. So definitely, yes, in terms of memory efficiency and classification. Now, you can also learn this matrix or the index if you could, uh, yeah, there are many ways. I mean, I mean, you can train it inefficiently, say, and then post prune. If it was a batch problem, if it was not really online, the robot is not learning on its feet, you, can, you have the data set, it's one million instances, that's it. You can, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, do the training inefficiently and then drop edges uh, or weights. I talked about the online learning hours, they, 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 they drop dynamically during the updates, but you could do it post too. Yes? 
Um, no, they don't. But the question is, if they were dependent, you might get more accuracy using more uh, involved methods. Right. So and in a lot of cases, yes, the classes are related. Uh, they are. They some classes are closer to each other. Some class. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, and so some, on some classes you have high confusion. Some pairs or groups of classes you have high confusion. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, it's not just one feature. The other features vote too. There are, all the features are active. So the, the voting can still lead to discrimination. But uh, yeah, in some cases the features are not good enough. Uh, all the classes share certain features and so, so on and so forth. Um, so let me uh, talk about the accuracy experiments. Uh, uh, the accuracy measure that we are talking about is uh, it's just simple accuracy, or 1 minus 0, 1 error. So uh, uh, the, the algorithms that, uh, that I'll show uh, in the next page, all of them can be th seen as ranking the classes. So uh, given an instance, you sort the classes based on a uh, score. And the top class, if you care about the top class only, that's accuracy at rank 1, R1. Simply zero, uh, 1 minus uh, 0, 1 error. Um, uh, in many cases, yes, your instance belongs to exactly one class, and we'll just focus on that. But in some cases, the instance can belong to multiple classes. It's called multi-label classification. Um, but let's focus on the simpler case. Then uh, R5 or R10 or whatever K is, uh, did you get the right class in top five? You ranked your classes. Maybe it wasn't in top one. Top one is hard, hard. How about in top five if K is five? So I'll be reporting our R1 and R5. Um, so yeah, these are the two columns that are accuracy. The rows of this table are different algorithms. And then uh, the, 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 the other uh, columns are measures of efficiency, like training time, average ed edges touched, a number of edges in your matrix, and so on. So OOS and MR are, are, and feature focus, FF is feature focus, are different uh, indexing algorithms that I talked about uh, briefly about F feature focus is simply proportion computation. Uh, Emma is a non-stationary version of that with margin and so on, learning rate. And Ooze is a little more involved bookkeeping and so on. It has a budget, budget and so on. MMP is multi-class, multi-label perceptron. These are the closest in the family of algorithms. Uh, passive aggressive is a, a, a more advanced version of MMP. Um, Perceptron, these are binary classifiers. Perceptron, committee of perceptrons, or linear SVMs with different parameters like regularization of C equals 1 or, and so on. So, uh, so uh, these are binary classifiers, but because these uh, data sets have a taxonomy, the Reuters data set or web page data set, uh, you can do top down. Uh, so uh, the, re the results here are from top down uh, for these methods. So the, then in a nutshell, summary, you get better or similar accuracies uh, compared to these methods. And you get uh, much less training time. And uh, the number of edges touched on average is significantly lower. So that's uh, a, an indication of uh, a classification time. And th this is the memory size, the number of edges in the, uh, in the system, the number of uh, non-zero weights, basically. OK? And so the number of non-zero weights, the difference could be close to an order of magnitude, let's say hierarchical, uh, using hierarchical techniques or not. Uh, passive aggressive. Um, in terms of accuracy, it's closest to ooze, can be better than ooze, uh, especially these numbers are when I didn't do TF-IDF. I didn't know TF-IDF would make a, such a big difference. Uh, TF-IDF normalization is a way of processing the, um, uh, the vectors, representing the training instances. But anyway, the message to take is that you gain in a lot in accuracy, and you don't lose much. Uh, uh, you gain a lot in efficiency, and your accuracy are as good as or better, and sometimes maybe 1% or 2% lower, but um, uh, not drastically lower. And that was the goal of our, uh, that, that was what we hoped for. Uh, the web page one is similar to the Pascal challenge last year that uh, Paul mentioned, the 12,000 classes. And there, uh, we did run pass passive aggressive. This is kind of like multi-class perception to completion. It takes longer, but go, uh, yeah, that gave us uh, better accuracies than ooze in that challenge. Um, okay, but yeah, again, the issue is when you increase the number of classes. So, for example, for the web page, we had 14,000 classes. This is again a subset, 
a sample of the uh, subset of the data set. For Rogers, we had 400 classes. We put the topic and industry classes together. Jane Austen is a, is a word prediction problem, like a specific language modeling. Given the words we have seen so far, what's the next word that's going to appear in this sentence? So over, you had 17,000 classes there. And I, I couldn't run some of these. Uh, 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 for these experiments, uh, I couldn't run some of the classifiers, other techniques. So you don't see all the, uh, all the experiments, here, all the results. Uh, OK, so these are experimental calls. So sometimes it might be because you know, uh, I had some checks in the, in the loop for uh, Emma that uh, it's a good question. But yes, it could be that. Um, uh, yes, um, it could be that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't remember. But Emma usually, uh, also the number of passes, uh, Emma. Uh, uh, required it, this p means in the number of passes. So these are online algorithms, and um, while they are online, to get the best accuracy, you usually require multiple passes over the training data. And so this one took the best results were obtained after 20 passes, and the time is for the total number of passes. Sorry, the exponential decay rate. Yes, I know that. a few. So I'm reporting, for example, the best. Uh, learning rate and the best margin threshold, the two major parameters. Also for the other uh, algorithms too, like regularization for SVM, we played with 1 and 10. Obviously, uh, you could do another thing. You could play with the, reg uh, you could pick the best classifier for each class. These are uh, hierarchical. You train a binary classifier. You could play with uh, different regularization for each class. Of the, that takes even longer and so on. But yeah, we played, uh, for all the algorithms, we played a little with the different um, uh, parameters that they had. Um, any questions on these? This, day, uh, this next one is just says that we tested them on a smaller data sets with fewer classes too. Okay, So a small Reuters is another data set that had 10 classes. News groups had 20. Industry had 100. Here, again, the accuracy are similar. Training times are comparable, sometimes better. Memory is comparable, sometimes better. But these are very relatively small data sets. Um, OK, so then this is the Unix prediction. This is the desktop activity. Josh, uh, there were, this, this is data on 100 uh, so users. Let me t try to explain this uh, table. So each point is a user. And the higher the point is from the 0, means our method worked better than the com uh, comparison method. So the comparison method is just using what you did last, uh, A-U-R. Uh, uh, it's basically Emma, but only using the last thing you did uh, to predict what you're going to do next. OK, and then um, the y-axis is how much we are doing better uh, by using other features. So this is Unix. What you did last is the last command you typed. But the, the directory you are, um, the last two commands, uh, not just the full command, but what file you touched or what action you, what execute, uh, uh, what uh, Unix command you type, we make it differentiate. So there are several things. You could use time of day uh, and so on. So there are several features. Uh, still, the question is whether these features are predictive. We could see that on some users, uh, especially uh, the green ones are those users that had at least 1,000. So we had uh, the various users used uh, uh, the system for two months, three months, and they had different uh, interact, uh, different amount of uh, number of uh, training instances for each. We had different training instances for each. So uh, as the system gets warmed up, we see that the difference uh, gets higher. So the green ones are, yeah, I get, we had more than 1,000 instances from them. This is online problem. This is a totally online. Yeah. So you predict, then you see what the user did actually. Again, you predict, and 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 so it's very non-stationary. Non-stationary. And um, and previous authors had uh, had noted that their their uh, the the AUR or MI uh, exponential moving average using one feature is better than other techniques. So we didn't have to compare to everything. But uh, but in any case, we we are showing that yes, other features all voting together and. Um, uh, aggregating the votes, you get uh, significant improvement on almost all users. Uh, this is just says that this problem is very non-stationary. You need to continue to adapt. So this is one user, Scientist52, 
uh, that x-axis is the number of um, uh, uh, instances or commands you have seen from them, and you're continue, your system is continually learning, right? Um, LIFO is just uh, predict uh, the, the last thing they did, or the last five things, OK? Uh, and you see that uh, these are the different versions of Emma. Uh, it just says that uh, if you stop training, your performance goes down. So the blue one or the purple one or the green one, you stop the training after maybe seeing 1,000 instances or 2,000 instances and so on. And you use only the model that you got after seeing the first 2,000 instances. And you see that if you stop learning, the, the, uh, uh, the performance goes down as a function of time. Um, so you, uh, and uh, eventually, like for example, this line, even LIFO uh, uh, is doing better. Um, but if you continue learning, you see that uh, the cumulative uh, accuracy stays and has a, sl a slight slope upward. So it just tells you that you, keep, you need to keep learning here for these type of uh, online interaction uh, tasks. It's, this is just another. Uh, I, this is what Paul mentioned last year. Uh, that uh, the Pascal challenge with text categorization of 12,000 classes, and uh, we did really well on this task. Uh, passive aggressives and ooze basically did really well, uh, both uh, the top, top one and so on. Um, a, a lot of other techniques were used um, there, hierarchical mix. Yeah, the top-down techniques, uh, the ones that use hierarchical, their accuracy was usually bad, and the organizers said that the, the people use them because, to gain efficiency a little. Uh, basically, the conclusion was, the, and uh, a lot of people didn't use pure top-down. They did top, to, uh, they used top-down for the first two levels, say, then they used some other techniques. It was a hybrid technique that they used. Because top-down, the accuracy was really bad. And in our the papers, we showed too, that top-down using taxonomy, it's harder. You have to encode the taxonomy, and uh, and uh, it's, the accuracy is not good. For efficiency, this is a simple algorithm that's even that's uh, in terms of memory and so on simpler. And so. Uh, okay. So there is a few. Th uh, okay. So if you care about uh, tree loss, so you might your system might get that uh, the right class uh, might get it wrong. Okay, but might classify it near. That so, it, uh, like instead of classifying in the women's apparel, it might classify the advertisement in men's apparel. Um, so that may not be as bad a loss as it classifying that advertisement in sports or whatever in politics. So using taxonomy does show slight advantage, uh, top down, uh, in uh, for that sort of error, the tree loss. How distant was the system's classification from the true class? And you look at the shortest path in the tree, in the taxonomy. So there is some slight advantage uh, on that. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's. The other thing about I wanted to mention is um, it's not necessary that you want to do top down. You, you have a taxonomy. You may, may, uh, there are other techniques that do bottom up, top down, uh, uh, oscillates, and so on. So they are less efficient even, but they can give you more accuracy too. So top down has a problem. Yeah, it's, uh, if you make a mistake at the top, then you're host. But, um, there are techniques that use bottom or top down. They try to do some consistency, and they get better accuracies. But they're, uh, I haven't tried them, but uh, yeah, from the papers, they seem to be uh, highly inefficient. So it requires. So I'm a little skeptical. I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, the favorite. Uh, you just use the data to tell you what, what's needed rather than uh, prior knowledge. But uh, depends on. OK. Yes. I was just wondering uh, if you have like different subsets of like Phoenix users, and you have people at university. Yes, there were four types of users in that data gathering. There were computer scientists, which had most data, and they were the hardest to predict because they had the most richest in, uh, involvement, I guess, with their, their Unix. And there were novice users, beginning programmers, and programmers. There were four. And the yeah, CS people, we had most data, and they were the hardest predict, and we could show, I think, the most improvement using our method that aggregate multiple data, uh, multiple features than just using the last feature. But did I answer your question? So well, I just, just wanted to get some insight on how you explored or did some of the tuning, or, or if there's specific features you did to capture the non-stationary um, 
Mm -hmm. so, so I found that, for example, in text data or other data sets that are usually batch, you just do cross-validation, uh, your learning rate had to be relatively small to get the right weights to get the best accuracies, like the beta factor, like 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. This one, this was an online method, and I found that the learning, relatively high learning rate, I had to do some tuning. Like, uh, had, uh, had, had, like 0.1 or 0.05 was better. Because it was non-stationary, you had to adapt, and you kind of need to forget the past fairly quickly. Now, the question is, in real life setting, what learning rate to choose? Um, there are techniques that would experiment with several learning rates uh, in parallel and would converge to those and so on. But yeah, uh, it's an uh, interesting observation that, yeah, um, in this non-station case, we had to have a high, relatively high learning rate, quick adaptation, uh, compared to other data sets that are batch, mostly. But a lot of data is, is non-station. I mean, text data, advertisements change, you know, emails change, um, Reuters, like a classification, articles change, events change. So there is this non-station in a lot of other tasks. It's just not representative, I, I, I think, that well in, in the, in the conferences, in the publications, they are mostly focusing on the classic batch learning and so on. They, don't, they assume no, no change. So have you tried associating weights with features themselves? Yes. So is that kind of accounted for in the features class? Good question. I think uh, there is room for algorithms. I mean, uh, I haven't published or maybe just mentioned in one of the papers. But you can also have a weight for the feature, uh, especially it goes well with Emma. So each feature is trying to predict and so on. But some features have very, I mean, they're not predictive at all, or they're very, like the. In text category, the or frequent features, they are not informative. They appear in every document and so on. So they, they, they develop low weights anyway, but also you could have a weight, weight for predictiveness of that feature, and that could be updated too, in parallel, for example. And that can help too. Um, but it has to be well studied exactly when and so on. But yeah, that's a, that's a good idea too. Yeah, the data sets, uh, well, uh, some data sets come up with the, come, come with the features, at least uh, if you want to compare to others like Reuters. Some, uh, but the, uh, in text categorization, uh, it's fairly uh, understood that it's to the terms. You just do tokenization, a standard tokenization, maybe do lim limitization or not. But basically, the terms in the, you know, I didn't do feature dropping. But again, Reuters had came up, with the Reuters, the new version of Reuters 10 years ago has a standard features uh, that some scientists have published. Use these if you want to compare. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yes. You won't never get it. During testing, you never get the answer. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so the training there is uh, after 20 years of uh, Yahoo directory or there are other data sets too, you, you, do, you do begin with lots of data. So now a million web pages have been classified. And hopefully the, the classification won't change. It's not that non stationary, it's fairly stationary. And uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I don't have an answer to that, uh, just saying uh, you have to, to see whether your system is classifying correctly. If there is any concept drift or and so on, you just need to take a sample of uh, uh, the new data and see whether it classifies. Or you have to manually classify it and see whether uh, the, the system classifies at, at a certain accuracy level, or has it gone down. Um, but yeah, that's that's the bad thing about supervised learning. Uh, you have to have training data. In some cases, training data comes sort of for free. For example, for online this, that in that task. But in some cases, yeah, you have to. That's why I talked about systems that learn their own concepts. They use supervised learning, but they make their own concepts. Uh, uh, yeah, but usually there is no <laughs> free lunch. You have, in some cases, you have to label. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, uh, okay. the scientists can, can you mention that uh, you know, one reason you got paid for it is because uh, the features are correlated? You're, you're basically Yeah, and almost, yeah. So, so basically, it depends on the data set, right? Like, you, you mentioned about, for instance, applying algorithms like this to, um, you know, computer vision problems. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, brown and yellow, so, yes. so I want that you can, you can be the champion. Now yeah. you're updating uh, yeah. Yeah. the classic. So, I don't know, this is not exactly the, my niche of, like, machine learning, but when you 
Yes. Uh, you know, past, you know, like in there, the people used to be like um, maximum entropy, you know, model. So I mean, how do you compare, you know, to that? Like, mm. those are very expensive. Yes. So yeah, uh, there's the assumption about that features are fairly predictive and there is not much interaction or, uh, among the cl classes. The, another assumption that we're making is that a linear matrix, a linear class where will do well versus nonlinearity and so on. Uh, and max entropy uh, is also a, a linear classifier. So uh, I, I would say in terms of efficiency, yes. So max entropy doesn't scale to the type of uh, uh, data sets that like a speech people want to class, uh, train their things. They want to train on billions of words. And the more words, the, more, the bigger the group are, usually the better accuracy. So that's this, uh, again, in terms of accuracy, I would say depends on the task. But on some tasks, it might be inferior to maximum entropy. Because that, uh, one thing it is, it's an online algorithm. So there are many aspects. Uh, both are linear. Uh, but this is an online algorithm. If you uh, made it a batch algorithm, so it would uh, have an explicit regularization, then it would be competitive with max entropy. But right now, I would say in some tasks, it might be inferior uh, so let, 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 let me in terms of accuracy. Yeah. Yeah. Also. Yeah. So I'm interested in batch versions of these algorithms where you have explicit explicit objective. So here the objective has been. Uh, try to find a matrix or a hyperplane that separates the data or nearly separates the training data. So you get very little or zero uh, error. Uh, but that's it. Now, things like SVM or max ent uh, or, uh, log, uh, or uh, likelihood methods, they usually have a regularization that helps them generalize better. So uh, there are, I think, uh, well, I can write, for example, formulations where you want to improve, like the ooze has uh, a minimization for uh, um, slack for hinge loss. And you can also say plus, just like uh, SVMs and so on, uh, take the, make sure that the total number of weights, just sum the weight in your matrix that you're learning, uh, that, that sum of the two, uh, try to minimize the sum of the two, the loss on the error, basically, and the weights. Yeah, there, there, I can definitely think of. Uh, variations of these that are batch and with a, a, a regularization objectives just like Maxon and so on to get better accuracy. And again, you might pay during training, but let's say you could parallelize it. You had uh, uh, machines with enough memory and uh, many of them. And so then you, you might pay during the learning uh, uh, more cost, but it's more accurate. And it's still sparse. So during classification, it's still efficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for the Pascal, like hmm? yeah. So for Pascal challenge, uh, for the passive aggressive, which is very similar to this, and was getting best results, um, uh, similar to Ooze, uh, we did post pruning. We decided, okay, what if we now after training, after waiting several days to train, uh, let's uh, drop the weights, and up to fifty percent or maybe even seventy percent of the weights we could remove. Without, uh, so these are feature class corrections, not the feature entirely. But uh, up to 50% or more, 70%, we could remove on that task without affecting accuracy. Uh, and uh, experiments with OOS showed that, yeah, uh, with uh, only 100 or 200 features connected, you get 3 4% accuracy uh, thing, but you get one third or one fifth or one tenth of the total weight. So, uh, yes, there's the idea of also you can post prune. And you don't get, you might not get uh, accuracy, uh, uh, um, yeah, um, 
damage or but then afterwards if you uh, prune more then you see a decrease in accuracy um, yes So for text categorization, you can assume it's a static, uh, uh, um, uh, usually up to bigrams and trigrams that can help. And, but you can assume it's static. So if you see a new document and has a new word, you could uh, map it to unknown. That's what uh, speech processing people do. So they fix a vocabulary of 20K or 50K. And even in, our, in, their, in their training set, they have a symbol unknown. And any term or any, uh, any unigram maybe misspelling or some new word, they're going to map it to unknown, and it, it has its own weights and connections and so on. That's one way. So you keep the feature vocabulary static. Uh, so hundreds of thousands, uh, for example, for the Pascal challenge, yeah, I think a few uh, hundred thousand or more uh, vocabulary on my speech uh, uh, experiments too. Uh, the, the class uh, size could be 50,000 or 100,000, and uh, the features could be, as I said, usually maybe an order of magnitude higher or at least several times higher. Because the features are, uh, like for uh, statistical language modeling, which is the predicting of next word or next engram, it's uh, location dependent. The, feature, the term or the engram that appeared immediately before what you're trying to predict, the engram before that, and so on. So, and then you distinguish between location because you get, you get better accuracy. So anyway, so you get uh, the, uh, the feature set could be hundreds of thousands. Uh, so in, the, in, the, in the image data set that I showed you, again, our feature set went to 100,000. Or... Yes, yes. Um, it, it's fine. Uh, I mean, especially these online methods, the number of classes can grow, the number of features can grow. If somehow you get the labels too, that, that, that catches what's the task. Do you get the labels or the, do humans, or do you have a, a staff to, to label to get, provide the learning data? These algorithms, uh, is, yeah, it doesn't matter. You start with an empty index, the feature set can grow, the class set can be dynamic, that some classes can get old, and you might have some policy to drop certain classes or features. Um, and uh, you just give new ideas. Uh, batch methods, you have to retrain um, periodically and so on. Uh, but that's fine. If, if it's not such a uh, non-stationary process, that's fine too. So either per, per excuse me? Uh, uh, so uh, depends on the task, but like, yeah, basically policies of the sort um, features that are not predictive or you haven't seen recently, um, you can order them based on uh, the latest time you saw them, for example. If you haven't seen them in the new products descriptions or new uh, pages, uh, drop them last month. So you, you can sort them and just drop the tail or something. Um, uh, if, because you have to keep, uh, you don't want to run out of memory. And it's similar for classes. So, uh, yeah. Sure. Sure, yes.